Chesney, welcome to the Freedom Pact podcast. Well, thanks for having me, man. So one thing about your story that really interests me is that a lot of people assume that success just happens overnight to some people and they don't see the sort of work and progress behind it. And for yourself, you found success at 19 years old through film and, and a giant hit. And people might have the assumption that, you know, that was just a, a lucky break and that you, you know, you had this overnight success, but what was the process for you like before that success at the young age? What was your journey like up to that point? Um, well, I grew up in a very rock and roll household. My dad was a pop star. He was in the band called the Tremolos. Mm. So I grew up around music. Music was like, you know, I had guitars propped in every corner and, and, uh, you know, my dad's friends were all 60s superstars like, uh, Jerry Marsden from Jerry and the Pacemakers and people like that. Um, but to be quite honest with you, my story, uh, my journey was, yeah, you know, there was there was no doubt from the very very beginning that this is what I was going to do from me anyway. I was a very very kind of precocious as a kid, and uh, my dad always says I came out singing. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was I, I made a record when I was nine years old, um, and then I had bands. Um, you know, as young as twelve, thirteen years old, my my younger brother is the drummer in, in my band and has always been. Um, so, so we grew up performing really. Um, uh, when I was like 15 years old, I was already playing, um, piano bars and, and, uh, and pubs and stuff like that, you know, sitting there playing John Lennon, John Lennon songs and, uh, Billy Joel and Stevie Wonder. And, uh, and, uh, so I had, that much experience um beforehand um you know i d i definitely i definitely did play a lot you know so i had i had experience so but but you're right i was young um and literally just out of school to be quite honest with you um when i got the part in buddy song with roger daltrey which is where it all kind of started um and I only accepted the, that role because I, it was a musical based film. And I, I thought, oh, goodness, this is my way into the music industry, you know. Um, so. So that was it. That was my that was my real kind of journey. I, I did play a lot of gigs. I did play a lot of, uh, you know, little places where, um, you know, one day it would be. You know, I'd be sitting in the corner of a pub and uh just playing chords and and making shit up as i went along and uh and just kind of doing my own thing i think that's where i learned my my craft really playing um as a musician and then other nights it would be you know everybody around the piano asking for requests uh, so invaluable experience from a very young age um and uh it definitely um stood me in good stead um you know as time went on for sure a lot of people who may have a similar dream to, to you had, they might be scared to chase it because it's not the, the safest. There's not much job security there. There's not a lot to fall back on. What do you think attracted you to this lifestyle where you're almost in control of your own destiny? Did the nine to five, did the rat race ever tempt you? No, no, I never had any of that. Um, what For me, the only reason um, that, uh, I couldn't do anything else is because I had so much passion for it. I, I lived and breathed music. I still do, you know, I mean, look what you can see me. I know that your listeners can't see me, but I'm surrounded with instruments and like, you know, and in my family, in my household, it's the same as when I was growing up, there's guitars propped in every corner and musical instruments everywhere. Um, it was really a matter of like, well, there's nothing else that this is it. I never had a backup plan. <laughs> The only other real job that I had was, uh, was a paper round, um, back, you know, when I was like 15, 14, 15, something like that. I was actually Billy Ocean's paper boy, would you believe? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, so yeah, for, so for me, that was it. Um, I only, I only had music in mind and, uh, and I think there's something to be said for that, to be quite honest with you. Um, not having a plan B, you know, can be quite a good thing um especially in a business like this um there's so many um p 
pitfalls and problems and and uh, knockbacks and uh, you know difficulties in in this business that if you have um, if you don't have that drive um, and that kind of mentality of I'm going to do whatever it takes and I'm not I'm not going to not do this it's not like I'm going to give this a year and then if it didn't work out I'm going to go into accountancy or something you know there was never any of that and I do think that that you'll find that the people that do make it will will invariably have that kind of mentality you know I suppose if you give you 100% to something and you, you don't give yourself, um, you know, that fallback option. You've got no choice, but to be resilient when that, when the hard times come. Yeah. yeah you got no choice. Exactly. That, that's the, that's the whole point. Um, you can't, uh, you know, with, without a, a backup plan or a plan B or, you know, a lot of people do that. It's like, I want to follow my dreams of becoming a musician. And, uh, uh, but, uh, just in case I'm going to, I'm going to do a, a business class or, or something like that, which, you know, for every parent out there will relate to and i'm the same i mean I, I i want my kids they all want to go into the business and i'm like well maybe you should think about a backup plan you know so so i'm a bit of a hypocrite in that respect but but i will always always um be there for them and and, and support them in whatever they are passionate about because i think it's important i think it's important in life you know some people love to do what they what they do for a living some people love it some people really don't you know, so it's like, I was speaking to my my 19 year old son the other day and um, he's his um, dreams are acting. You know, he wants to go to the Royal Shakespeare and uh, he wants to, to be on stage. That's his thing. He's a he's a thespian, darling. But uh, <laughs> because obviously right now in the you know, with the crazy uh, times we're living through right now, there's, you know, there's no stages to step onto. There's no boards to tread. So. Um, so he started to think about, you know, a backup plan and he's talking about going to like a, you know, a different schools and, and, and trying to get some kind of uh, something else going, you know, which is great. But I had to kind of like sit him down and remind him that, you know, remember what your passions are. And, and if, if whatever, um, whatever makes your juices flow and gives you that excited feeling, that's what you should be doing for, you know, pursuing in life because you'll always be happy. You know? We we mentioned that you found that success at a very early age and, you know, the success and the fame at that age and all the responsibility that comes with it. Were you equipped at 19 years of age to handle all that properly? Because you see a lot of cases uh, in your industry where people aren't ready for that. Yeah, of course. I don't think you're ever really equipped for what, what hits you when you have that kind of success. Um, I had a good family around me for sure something that i always talk about is, is that my i talked about my brother just earlier on you know he was 17 when i first made it with the one and only and he was my drummer then and he really kept my feet on the ground because he could tell me i'm being a dickhead you know what i mean <laughs> which i probably was on many occasions because it's easy to believe the hype it's easy to believe that you're something special when really it's all bullshit. You know, it does, it's not real. None of it is. I just had a, a job that, uh, happened to be, you know, ex be, for me to be exposed to, to millions of people. And I got to travel around the world, which was great and all that kind of stuff. Um, but as I, as I found out at that early age, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't always last. And, and most of the time it actually doesn't. <laughs> um, so, so for me, I was lucky that I had a father that had been through it um, and kind of helped me with advice and how to get through the pitfalls of press. And, you know, I remember him saying to me, don't believe anything. And that really helped because you read a lot of stuff and you hear a lot of stuff and you, you experience a lot of things, you know, you've experienced a lot of hate to be quite honest with you. Um, so, he said just don't believe the, the good stuff don't believe the bad stuff and you, you you'll be okay you'll be neutral you know and uh so I, I would think i was lucky there are a lot of people um that were in my in the same kind of um you know places that i was in at a young age that weren't so lucky um you know and i i do a lot of mentoring young kids in in this business now and 
writing and producing for them and you know i'm able to kind of impart some of some of the wisdom that was imparted down to me uh, which helped me uh, get through it all and that's the most important thing is that don't believe any of it don't believe the hype um, because it's not real none of it is real and you know there's a lot of these kids that are coming into the business and not just music business that but like you know reality tv things like the love islands and next factors of the world and these companies are beginning to get better but there was never any support you know you, you get you get chewed up by this huge machine you're on the front pages of, of the papers and and of course nowadays with the uh, social media you got you're getting hit from every single angle and you get built up and suddenly you know you're at this place you've got money everything and then you know as you know it very much invariably ends up in tears and uh, and they get spat out by the machine and these kids have no nowhere to turn and there's no support and i i I do know now that they are starting to um, to bring in um, therapists and and people to talk to, which is so important. It's so important. But it took people to to literally take their own lives to to kind of wake wake that business up, wake their entertainment business up. So, you know, that is something I, I want to touch on a bit more. Um, before we get there, if we're carrying on chronologically, um, we're speaking to you about at a young age and something that. I, you know, I really wonder when I think about your story is you're 19 years old, you're at the, the top of the charts for weeks on end. I wonder if you suffered any imposter syndrome, you know, being thrust into the charts, for example, and being surrounded by these timeless artists at the time, like Queen, Cher, you're up there. Did you suffer any imposter syndrome at the time? What, like kind of what I, I don't belong here? Yeah. The thing. Um, it's funny because as I said earlier, I was, I was definitely a precocious kid and I grew up around fame. My, my dad, all of his friends, um, I was almost like, kind of like the prince in waiting. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt. And when I actually did make it, it, I was probably unique in, in, in that respect in that I kind of thought, okay, this is what happens when you release records. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I took it all in my stride, to be honest with you. There were moments, I will not, you know, I, I, I definitely, I tell you that, uh, where I thought, wow, this is crazy. You know, like meeting um, George Harrison and, and Eric Clapton backstage at Yokohama Stadium and them kind of, you know, taking me in and, you know, meeting Paul McCartney and saying, I love your record, man. I was like, those kind of moments were like, you know, mind blowing, of course, of course they were. But the whole kind of fame thing, um, I was so young. I didn't really have time to kind of think about it. You know what I mean? Mm. I, I look back and, you know, all my friends were going to uni and doing this, the stuff that uh, any, you know, teenage young lad would do in England. And, uh, and, I, and I missed out on all that stuff. Um, but I did have this crazy ride. <laughs> and, you know, I'd, I, I was out of that loop for such a, a long time out of all everyday life you know i i didn't i didn't go to the supermarkets or I, you know i couldn't go couldn't go out you know it was a very kind of a, a weird existence in a way which uh you know i found out you know years later when i had to pay my first bills and things like that but i was a bit late on i was late to the to the party in that respect mm -hmm. I watched an interview you did um, on a TV show in the UK and you were quite open and, and honest and, and, I, and I loved the interview, but you, you said this line, you said, I paid my dues in the music industry the wrong way round. What did you mean by that? <laughs> well, um, I meant because I had success at such a, such a young, young age, I hadn't really kind of, you know, played clubs where, where your amplifier blows up or, you, you know, play to two men and a two men in flat caps and a jack russell or you know that kind of thing i feel like that is paying your dues you know what i mean so when uh when the kind of time went on after the one and only mad time that i had there i was young i was young and i'd, I'd been dropped by my record label and couldn't get my my management label uh, my management company on the phone and all these people that i've kind of counted as almost family over the last three or four years because i traveled the world with them couldn't even get them on the phone you know so 
I kind of left it very much behind and purposefully said, I'm not playing that song. I'm not, I'm not going to do any of the old songs. I'm not even going to go out as me, you know? So I, I formed like bands. I wanted to be in Radiohead basically. So I, I just, you know, I, I, I turned, turned my back to the audience. I shoe gazed. I turned up to 11, told anyone to bugger off if they asked for the one and only. And I formed these bands, you know, I had a band called Ebb, I had a band called Fly. <laughs> this is all through the 90s, you know, so we'll try, everyone trying to be Radiohead. Um, so I played some shitty places uh, where nobody came and, you know, the equipment didn't work. And, and I went through all of those kind of t times, you know, where you don't get paid for anything or you pay to play. And, <laughs> you know, I moved over here to the States for a while and, you know, with a band and we lived you know, in a, in a two bedroom apartment, four of us, uh, just kind of, you know, with a crappy little, um, van trying to get around and get, get to gigs and in time and, you know, going on at, at first when nobody's there and people getting the name of the band wrong and things like that. So I did all that after the success. So, you know, it, it, that's what I meant by, by, you know, paying my dues the wrong way around. <laughs> You mentioned, um, you know, playing those gigs where it feels like nobody's watching and that, you, you know, these small mm. clubs and, and, you know, the experiences you just mentioned there. Did, what level did doubt start to creep in? Did you ever think to yourself, maybe I should have had a plan B or, or did you ever think this isn't going to work out for me? Yeah, that's kind of when it all started, that, that kind of self-doubt thing. Um, because I never had that as a kid, you know, I was always so confident um and then of course when you know i put my first record out eventually it goes to number one so of course in my head it's like i'm born with a silver spoon <laughs> you know what i mean i can't do anything wrong me let's do another one <laughs> so um you know i look back at that particular time when i was talking about earlier where a record label dropped me and i couldn't get my anybody on the phone and and it was like a realization I, I use the analogy of you know I was in the club and I got the champagne and and the girls and you know we got our own little booth and everything's great and I'm a VIP and then for some reason uh, you know the bouncer comes up and kicks you out and and you land on your ass in the at the back of the club in in the rain or you know on the curb that's kind of how it felt that i'd been excluded from the club and uh and so yeah of course doubt would have started to to creep in there um maybe i wasn't worthy of that um and then you know i tried and tried to kind of make it with, with different bands and different stuff and I, and I always knew the music was good but uh for whatever reason it just wasn't clicking and you know i guess in the music industry it's all about um right place right time you got to have the extra fairy dust sprinkled on there for uh, for good measure and and so yeah it, it, every every gig every week went by and uh you know a little bit more was chipped away i guess uh until i until i was a little, you know kind of down about the whole thing and realized that maybe I, maybe i i'm not what i thought i was if you know what I mean, mm. but then your your mindset changes. I mean, for me, I met my wife, um, and she kind of helped me get out of the hole financially that I managed to get myself in because I just, you know, back in the old days, I just bought everyone cars and spent it all on everything and ended up with nothing. I had that classic pop star story, you know, um, and now, uh, and I used to worry about what people thought about me. You know, uh, I don't really give a shit anymore about that stuff. I'm, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy. Um, and, and success to me is, it means a different thing. You know, it's more like a optimal daily experience that we all try and sustain over time. You know, I, I wake up and I think of the things that I'm grateful for and, and I kiss my wife and my kids and that's important to me. And now i make music again uh and play music again because i love it and that makes me happy so i think i'm on the right track again <laughs> it's 
Beautiful, man. I love the way you sort of openly talk in interviews about mental health issues as well. And I wonder that um, when you originally, you mentioned dropped by a record label, couldn't get your manager on the phone. Where did that take you mentally at the time? What was that experience like? Well, I think I hid it um, from myself and from everybody around me, really. But <clears throat> but I think it was a real knock, knock in the teeth uh, for me uh, because, you know, I was just talking earlier about these kids that are going through like Love Island or stuff like that, where, you know, everyone loves you and it's, and you're on top of the world. You got fame, you got money, everything's great. Uh, and then suddenly it's all just kind of like taken away from you like a deck of cards, which basically that's all that's built on that kind of life. So yeah, uh, I, I think I, I think I did go through a, a depression at that point, but I didn't really know what to do about it. Um, but I did just get up and, and carry on making music. I really did, uh, you know, whether it kind of was successful or not. I mean, I've never stopped making music because that's what makes me happy. And I honestly think that my wife, um, and, and since then my kids have, you know, overtaken all of that kind of, you know, wanting to have success, whatever success is, <laughs> you know, um, you know, if you ask me what success is you know, 30 years ago, it would have been, uh, it would have been hits, <laughs> you know, now it's bliss. Oh, love it. <laughs> so it, you know, it's, it's just, it's just how you look at life, isn't it? Yeah. I wonder now if you were sort of looking back on those times and you could, you know, give a word of advice to your younger self who was going through yeah. all that, what advice would you give him? Would it be this perspective you have on success now? Would that be the advice? Yeah, that would be the biggest thing, to be quite honest with you, because we all have this little voice in our head that that kind of tells you what they what it thinks is the right thing for you to do or the right thing for you to think. Um, and as a young person, you don't really know um, the power of thought, the power of what, what you say, out, you know, out of your mouth. Um, and, and so now I, it would be like, just be aware of what you're thinking because those thoughts take you down a place you may not really want to go and just be aware of what you have and what makes you happy and what what brings you that kind of uplifting feeling um, and concentrate on those things because I think that if you do that um, the other stuff falls into place mm -hmm. if you can I mean I realize that it you know there are a lot of people out there that are in a very difficult uh, you know place and uh, you know, de depression is, it's, it's a very big spectrum. I understand that. And I think I am lucky that I have a basically positive outlook on life. And, uh, and I've always been able to kind of somehow think and, and push my way out of any, any kind of black hole, if you know what I mean. And, and I do realize that there are a lot of people that find that very difficult to get out of that. Um, but for me, it is a simple answer and it's just, you know, be aware of your thoughts and, and think, just look around you and, and, and see what actually does make you happy. Mm -hmm. Follow that. Follow the, it's like follow the light as it were, you know? I think it's great that you're so honest about, you know, the, the low times rather than just the high times. I think a lot of people in, in, in your industry or in your position, they seem to focus so much on the good times. And, you know, from the outside looking in, um, that isn't always the best case when, you know, someone's locking on. It's like with kids these days, they look on Instagram and they see all these perfect lives and it maybe mm. makes them feel worse about their own. So yeah. do you think that's why maybe you're so open about it? Do you think it's important for people in positions of influence like yourself to be open about the bad times, not just the great times and the highlights. I do. I do because it's a journey life, isn't it? And you learn things as you go on and uh, as you get older and you experience things, um, y you do learn these things. Um, so it is good to be honest. Um, and, and if I can help anybody with this thing that I have acquired, this fame thing that I've acquired in life, then, then, I should, <laughs> you know, it's like, I almost feel like it's, it's a baton to, to take on, um, and, and be able to, to speak, um, about my experiences, um, in a way that it could maybe re relate to some, somebody that, 
that's at home in a in a place that I'm in a similar place that I could have been in and it just makes them think well if he's managed to think his way out and 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 get on with life and dust himself off and find himself you know a place in life then I can you know I I, I think it's really really important to talk about uh, even the difficult things like suicide it's like it's 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 the right thing to do you know it, because if you don't talk about these things uh, and bring it out in the open to people that you th you feel might be suffering if you don't talk about it to them it, it it could just get worse whereas if you bring it out at least it gives them an opportunity to talk you know there, there's certain people in my life that I mean that I've lost uh, through suicide that you know you wish you could go back of course I mean that's it's what everyone says when whenever you lose somebody like that um, and it's probably that is probably why I I talk more about these kind of issues because if if I can at all you know push them in a way or, or or put something in their head that makes them think there is light at the end of the tunnel there might be light at the end of the tunnel even uh, then then I've, I've done then I'm hopefully helped someone now you're you've heavily involved yourself in charity work um specifically in in, in human trafficking issues what does that do for you what does giving back um what does that do for you on on a personal level what does it do for your soul why is it so important for you to give back well giving uh generally giving is is a beautiful thing for a start um i get so much more joy uh from giving than receiving you know um but as far as giving back um to, to charitable efforts and stuff like that, as i said earlier on i i do feel like you know if you have a platform like this um you'd always be you you must have to give give something because if if people are listening then you've got to say something that means something that's going to try and that's going to help um and you know the the charity that you were uh, referring to just then a21 is a is this um you know tra tra child trafficking and i mean I, i've been with them um to bulgaria to <clears throat> to witness on the ground the kind of um cr crazy awful debaucherous people that 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 do this um and if you if you witness that kind of that kind of life and that that kind of horrible side to life you know i defy anyone that wouldn't want to help <laughs> you know so um so because i have this platform and uh because i'm able to to, to people d might listen um then of course then i'm going to do it and I, and that's something I've, i do more and more as i get as i get older is is that it, those kind of, that's more important to me than than almost anything else to be honest with you mm -hmm. You said in previous interviews that life for you now is all about looking forward to things that make you happy. What is happiness to you right now? And what advice would you give to those people out there that are in this constant pursuit of happiness? Well, I think the main thing for me um, that the advice I would give is, is just that, well, that your thoughts create your reality and they they also they they change your physiology and your chemistry and then your emotions you know it all comes from what's in your head so choose wisely you know so many people and and i have to say it's definitely a uk thing that cynicism is in us you know we we are a cynical bunch we really are and having lived over here um it's whether whether they mean it or not that you have a nice day actually means something i know that the the, the average cynical brit would say ah oh, bloody americans you know um you know they're just always so bloody happy or whatever you know <laughs> it means something it really does so so just be careful and, and don't get into those bad habits that that take you down they take you into that spiral and i realize that so you know that some people who have the, the the chemical imbalance it can be more difficult but literally your thoughts can change your chemistry 
They really can. I, mean, I know I've seen a little bit about your um, path. And, uh, you know, you've been very honest about that, right? It's all about, how, you know, what you say and what you think. Do you agree? Absolutely. And, you know, there's that age old saying that, you know, some people might, might not want to believe it, but at the end of the day, happiness is a choice for some people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's so true. Yeah. You can choose to be happy. But, and I know it sounds simple and almost too good to be true. And in some cases it probably is, I understand that. And there's work to be done and you have to go to some of the darker places that, you know, that you may not want to go to, but it's important to talk about them. Mm, yeah. You know? And I, yeah, I think there's so many things that go into that as well. I think like, I think one of the biggest things for me in terms of happiness is probably your social circle and the people yeah. you surround yourself Choosing. with and learn your life. Exactly. And yeah. I think in recent years, I've been almost ruthless in, not in a malicious way, but cutting people maybe out of my people. life who yeah. sort of, I, I did an episode the other day with a, with a former SAS soldier and we were talking about the, these two types of people in life. You either have drains or radiators and the drains are the type of people yeah. that suck all the positivity out of you. You know, you, you tell them this amazing achievement you've done, they tell you how they've done it better. Or, you know, you, you walk into work in the morning, they're the first people to say, oh, the weather's miserable today. And then there's the other type of people, that are these radiators that lift you up and take you to that other level. And so I think for me, that is a big thing. Would you, would you say the same? Are you quite conscious about the people that you let into your inner circle? A hundred percent. I'm so careful with, with who I um, spend time with. Because we all have those friends, don't we? That bring you, for whatever reason, it's just like, oh God. I need to go and have a nap, <laughs> you know, after be spending time with them. But we love them and, you know, sometimes you have to. And, of course, sometimes that's your own family, you know, for a lot of people. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I would say that I've done exactly what you've done, been ruthless about, um, you know, almost cutting people out or at least consciously not spending the same amount of time with the people that, that drain you and the people that bring you into a cynicism uh, uh, you know negativity in life moaners bloody moaners you know who wants to sit there and listen to people moan and of course that's going to affect your own mental health they're doing it to themselves it's the same thing i was talking about it's the it's the thought process it's the um you know what you say out loud my wife is great um she she always tells me off if i've if i've said something that that sounds a little bit you know, moany or, or negative. She's like, do you want to rephrase that? <laughs> you know, and you know, sometimes you have to snap, but it's like, well, I didn't mean like that. But then you're like, yes, yes. Okay. You're right. I was a bit negative there, you know? And of course, when you're a parent as well, I, this, this is something that, um, really the pair of me and my wife are really trying to be careful with is, is how we talk to our children, because that, at an early age, if you know at the importance of this stuff, if you know about this stuff, then it, then it can become general practice, mm -hmm. you know, and some kids get it. Some kids don't like my daughter is amazing. Uh, she, she knows exactly which of her friends uplift her and which ones are a bit of a pain in the ass. And she talks about it freely and openly. And she also talks to them about it. I mean, I couldn't have done that at, you know, she's, she's 17 now, but she's, she's been like that since, you know, through her teens, she's, she's always the one that her friends go to, you know? Mm. And I, I think it's directly, uh, from the way it was basically my wife. She's amazing. Um, speaks to her and, and gives her the, uh, the tools, you know? Yeah. I, I think, yeah, like you said about choices, it doesn't have to be personal. It doesn't have to be malicious and you don't have to feel selfish for making choices because I think at the end of the day, you in some cases have to look out for number one because yeah, sometimes nobody else is going to look after you no 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 exactly it's it's you have to fix yourself first and and once you've kind of got your your mindset right then you can actually you can actually give back a bit more you know you can actually have more in the tank to be able to help some of the friends that you you think maybe could do with a little bit of help um, and that's, that's okay to, it's not selfish, it's not selfish at all. In fact, it's the opposite of selfish, um, because you're going to, you, you, by working on yourself and making sure that you're okay, you'll be able to give 
you know, to your loved ones. I love the way a few times in this conversation you've in passing mentioned your children or your wife and you speak so beautifully of them. What is, what does family mean to you right now? It, it seems like it's everything to you. Yeah, no, it really is everything. Um, I, you know, this is why, um, lockdown has been so beautiful for me. Mm. I spend my half of my life, you know, on airplanes and, and, and touring away from my family. And I, and I mean that half the time. I really, it is about half the time. And this year, um, I've been with them, you know, every day. And we've been doing, uh, playing board games and doing puzzles on the dining room table and watching movies, family movies and having dinner together. And, uh, you know, it's been beautiful. Uh, and we've become so close. I'm sure that there's families out there that have done the complete opposite. I'm I'm sure, but but for me, it's been beautiful. It really has, and family is everything for me. I, I come from a very close family. Um, I'm very close with my parents and and my brother and sister as well. So you know, I think it's inbuilt in me anyway. But I love my kids. You know, I love my family. They're my favourite humans. <laughs> love that man. I love that. Um, w- one thing I'd love to get your opinion on. Um, I think in an industry like music, there's no blueprint to success it's not one of those industries where there's you know steps you know you have to take to become successful in Mm. so i wonder from your experiences or what you've learned in the industry what advice you would give to those people out there that maybe have a dream but don't know how they go about chasing it there's no blueprint to follow what what advice would you give well first of all um you have to have the 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 passion and the drive you really do It's, it's all very well like you know having a talent and thinking that you you might be a pretty good singer or something like that or you can play a bit of guitar if you don't have the absolute passion and drive for what you do and you love it then i really think you're going to struggle no matter what that's the most important thing nowadays there are so many different routes as you say to success um in uh, success in the music industry um and Sorry, my beeping's going off. I should let me turn off my WhatsApp. <laughs> I'm interrupting us. So, um, so you know, I feel like you know people do. They they say a lot of negative stuff about you know um, social networks and things like that now. That, um, but I think you can easily um, get your stuff out there now. When I was young, making music at 15, 16 years old. The only route to, you know, success in the music industry was to play gigs and get an A&R man to come and find you, to see you, Uh, you know, sending cassettes in, (laughs) into (laughs) record labels. And and it really was the most elusive thing ever. I mean, it was impossible almost, you know, whereas now, you know, everybody can put their their music on Spotify. You, You actually can do the whole thing yourself at a reasonable cost it's not it's not going to cost you millions like it, it, you can make music on your laptop for a start um and you can uh, upload it onto youtube and you know a lot of people make it that way and i realize the competition is extreme i realize that but it's in your own hands you know before it really wasn't in your hands you had to have that extra bit of luck you still have to have that extra bit of luck but you can put it out there yourself I never had that. So I see that as an exciting thing. And, it, and I think it's an exciting times, you know, all these young um, artists that I work with now, the ones that do well are the ones that have the passion and the drive and they, and they learn, you know, cause it's important to, to put, put time into your craft and they learn how to do it. And not just the playing and the writing and singing and everything else that, that goes into making records, but like um, records, listen to me, sound about a hundred years old. <laughs> um, but but also the uh, the digital side of it and, and the, you know, put it, making sure that you know how to, to, to kind of navigate the digital world out there and, and the internet. And so, I, you know, I think that it's an exciting time for kids. So, you know, just, go for it and just get out there write 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 and more writing is what i would say obviously i before i would have said play live but there's nowhere to play now <laughs> <laughs> but of course you can play live in front of a camera in front of a laptop and uh, you know it's powerful 
is powerful and you do if you if you're good enough and and you have the drive and you do it to you know and in the right way then there's no reason why you won't uh, you know be recognized yeah beautiful i just have a couple of questions left that we ask every guest that comes on the show the first one would be if you could sort of distill the lessons you've learned through your experiences in your career and life so far and you could just give one maybe short but impactful lesson or message that you'd want every person on the planet to hear that they could learn and benefit from what would chesney hawk's message to the world be <laughs> that's a big question it is a big question yeah it is um i think it would be try to figure out in your mind what your underlying beliefs are because we all have them and more often than not they're not right they're not correct figure out what you actually think about yourself and then say to yourself is that true and if it's not true then try and change that thought into something a little more positive amazing amazing we've mentioned throughout this conversation um different periods of your life in which different things define success to you different things define what made your life worth living but right now for chesney hawks what makes a life worth living love that's it man is there anything else in this world really it's love and i don't mean you know sex love and love of a partner i mean love i love you you know i do i love <laughs> you I, too I'm not, I, I'm not afraid <laughs> to say it you know and that is it you know i love my family i love my dogs you know i love that tree out there mm. and and if that makes me gives me joy that that you know, these little things give me joy so find the love man amazing one of my favorite answers to that question in 150 episodes so fantastic <laughs> man um good, man. Good. before i let you go are there any projects you're currently working on that our audience could check out and where can they support you oh bless you um well it's funny because everything got put on hold in covid i have an album ready to drop am i allowed to say drop my am, am i too old to say drop no you can say drop <laughs> i got a new album ready to drop uh, which uh, probably going to be next year now but if you, anything chesney hawks related if you're interested in coming to check me out go to chesneyhawks.com and uh you know i've got i've got everything on there that uh that I'm doing new new album to come. I've got a musical coming out soon. Hopefully, uh, oh. I've got a new po podcast actually that you'd be interested in. It's called "We're All a Bit Mental," <laughs> so it's very similar to what we're talking about now. Which uh, I will awesome. um, I'll send you a link once we're because we've only, only just started that. So that'll be on my website as well. So so ChesneyHawks.com. Thanks really for exciting, giving me a platform man. there. <laughs> no, my pleasure, man. Um, I wonder, you know, with the new album, have you got any? plans to maybe release it on vinyl i'm a big vinyl collector and i'd yeah. love to add a chesney hawks to my collection <laughs> that's great yes i will absolutely be releasing that on vinyl that's that is a, a a dream that i you know i haven't put anything out on vinyl since the early 90s so i really want to put this next album out on vinyl yeah i'll be sure to add it to my collection so thank you so much for coming on and, and bringing so much value i, I really enjoyed this conversation i I feel like I haven't stopped smiling since the start. So uh, thank you for that. <laughs> no, you're doing a great thing. And, you, you know, you should be proud of yourself for what you've achieved with this podcast. It's, uh, it truly is, um, it's big. And, and I think uh, you're an inspiration. Oh, thank you, sir. That means the world to me.